the papers there or watch their TV. It is another world, a world of hate, a world of uh, they, they don't look at us as strong anymore, where we are looked upon as a paper tiger, and they are pushing the envelope constantly. And unfortunately, during the Obama administration, they have been empowered enormously. I wrote my, uh, my third book about the uh, uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring. I looked at my people in Tahrir Square, and I remember my days in Tahrir Square because I went to the American University in Cairo, and it was located in Tahrir Square. So I remember my days walking in Tahrir Square for four or five years of my life, and I remember it very well. And I felt a lot of empathy and good wish for my people. I wanted them. I wanted them to be liberated. When I saw, when I saw them um, uh, rising, desperate for freedom and democracy, and I, uh, when I watched American media believing that it's coming, I, I wasn't very optimistic because I was looking I was looking for signs that will tell me if this is a real, true revolution or just another Arab revolution that is, this, it's a cycle of revolutions anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they live from one revolution to another. This is the state of affairs in the Muslim world. I was looking for a sign that says separation of mosque and state. There wasn't any. Removal of Sharia from the Egyptian constitution. Equal rights for non-Muslims, oh. Christians. Equal rights for women. I wanted to see women chanting, beating wives is not a husband's legal right. But I couldn't see any of these signs. All the signs were about remove Mubarak. But unfortunately, the problems of the Muslim world is far more complex than just taking out a, a dictator. To the West, this is a conflict of uh, tyranny versus liberty, and what Western mentality logic is that liberty will always win. See, that's how the West thinks. But unfortunately, in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, and especially Egypt. Egypt is a country of 5,000 year old history. Egypt used to be a superpower in the 7th century. It was part of the Byzantine Empire. There were two, two superpowers in the world at that time, and it was not the Soviet Union and, and the United States. It was the Persian Empire, the Egyptians and the Turks, under, uh, at that time it was the Byzantine Empire. And they were fighting each other constantly. For 10 years they were tired, demoralized, and the people hated their leaders. In no time in the 7th century, in one year, in the year 639, Egypt and Persia were both conquered by Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula that nobody thought about. See, these two superpowers were thought they owned the world. And they re neglected looking at the Arabian Peninsula because it was not a, a superpower. It was a very poor area of the world. It didn't have any rivers. It was a desert. And nobody cared about them. The, nobody wanted to conquer Arabia. At that time, it didn't have oil. And it was a desert. It was poor. And all the great conquerors never thought of it. So here they come out conquering those two civilizations in no time. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it can happen to superpowers. <coughs> Egypt never saw its glory days again, ever since Islam conquered Egypt. Egypt used to be a Christian nation. Egypt did not speak Arabic. And it, 
and it, the language of the Quran, which is Arabic, was forced on Egypt by the sword. And in just a few years, Egypt never saw its glory days again. It became a third power. And that proves one thing to us, that the passage of time does not necessarily mean progress in the right direction. Great civilizations can go through dark ages. And that could be a lesson that we can learn from a great civilization as Egypt. Uh, so, I want to also stress because whenever I speak, especially on college campuses, I'm accused of being an Islamophobe. You know, they tell us all. Whenever you speak about anything related to Islam, whether it is uh, uh, Sharia, political Islam, it doesn't matter. It's off limits. And especially during the Obama administration, I have noticed every time now I go to speak on college campuses, it's almost like I, uh, the intensity of the far left and the Islamic groups against me, it is horrendous. But I still get invited to speak. I'm one of the few that still get invited to speak because I reach, I reach the students' hearts and minds. And nobody, I, I say that, nobody cares to criticize religion, any religion, in the sense that the religion is a relationship with God. But if a religion expands itself so much that it becomes the state. And if that religious state, the Islamic state, has a legal system that is a godly, came from God, as they say, and that legal system that kills anybody who leaves Islam, and if that legal system forces a military institution on that state called the institution of jihad, then that state has opened itself to criticism. It's our duty to, to criticize the Islamic State. Yes. And that is why I have a duty to criticize and expose the Sharia state, the Islamic state, because it's simply very dangerous to our way of life, our constitution, and our civil rights, and our, uh, our, our way of life. Don't be intimidated by the, way, by the word Islamophobe or racist or bigot when you criticize Sharia. And let me now tell you why the day Islam assumed the role of the state, that's why you, what you answer. If people accuse you of being an Islamophobe, you say the day Islam assumed the role of the state is the day it must be criticized. Because it doesn't matter if the state is ruled by religion or secular, whatever. A, a state must be criticized. And if in Egypt and the rest of the Muslim world, uh, that's, that's what they want. They want an Islamic state, that, and they come here. All these Islamic groups in America. There are more Islamic groups in America than a Muslim population. It's unbelievable. The mosques are opening everywhere, and there isn't populations in these areas. Murfreesboro in um, Tennessee. Tennessee. It hardly has any Muslim population. And they want to build a mega mosque, 50,000 uh, 50, square foot mosque. Why? Because they say, we're going to convert this, the town into Islam. So it aims at the political system. Islam does not, does not want to uh, reach the hearts and minds of people. Islam wants to control people through the government. And that's why in all Muslim countries, leaving Islam is legal, it's punishable by death. That's Sharia. Can you believe it? Islam is the only religion on earth that punishes 
Muslims who are just born in the religion. I was just born in the religion.